Welcome to today's seminar at SNS. Uh, my name is Mikael Witteblad. I am the head of the research program here at SNS. Uh, today's seminar is a collaboration between the Institute of International Studies at Stockholm University and SNS. Uh, the aim is to bring leading, uh, insights from leading international economists to the Swedish policy debate. And we are very honored to have the award-winning uh, economist Lise Westerlen with us today. Lise is professor and head of economics department at University of Pittsburgh. She is also uh, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and editor for several uh, scientific journals. Her Research field are behavioral and experimental economics. Today, Lisa will talk about her latest research on behavioral uh, explanations to the glass ceilings uh, and barriers into women's careers. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, 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 also, a very welcome to uh, Anna Sandberg. Uh, postdoc in economics uh, at IIES, Stockholm University. Anna has studied how gender affects inequality on the labor market and will give comments and participate in the discussion. Today's moderator is Robert Östling, uh, assistant professor in economics at IIES, Stockholm University. Welcome, Robert. The stage is, your, is yours. yours. Um, hi, I'm Robert. I'm very happy to be here. I will try to talk as little as possible to give room to the speakers, first of all, and then the audience. Uh, so I will first let Lisa talk, and then we'll, I will let in, let's see, uh, let in a few questions from the audience, and after that we let Anna talk. So the only practical detail I want to say right now is that you should uh, keep your mobile phones in silent mode. But please use your mobile phones, and especially if you want to use Twitter, you should use the hashtag SNSKunskap to spread the word about uh, the exciting things that will happen here. So, uh, Professor Lisa Westerlund, the floor is yours. I'm trying to figure out this microphone. Can you hear me? No? I, yes? Okay. I think it might be easier if I just... Okay, now you can hear me. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. I am uh, delighted to see so many of you here. I'm delighted to share my uh, research with you. Um, and of course, um, being from Denmark, I'm always delighted to come back to Scandinavia. Walking around last night at 10 p.m. and seeing the sun and the clouds and feeling the fresh air um, made me question once again what... I'm doing on the other side of the Atlantic. So um, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, the research I'm going to talk about today is part of a larger research agenda that I've had on trying to understand why it is that women continue to struggle uh, to sort of make it up through the upper levels of management and corporations. And uh, throughout the world, we sort of see women getting more and more education um, They tend to do really, really well in school. Um, in many corporations, they come into corporations in equal numbers. And yet, when we... Uh, and now I'm trying to figure out how to work this. Yet, when we uh, see them climbing up through the corporations, women seem to have a much harder time um, making it to the very upper levels. And there are many ways to try to understand why this happens. Obviously, we all know that women have children, Um, that's clearly an explanation, so this is not to diminish any of the biological factors that, that could influence why it is that men and women um, differ in the way that they move up to the very top. But one of the things that we do see when we look at what happens when you come in to the corporation is that the jobs that you end up with in the corporations differ. <clears throat> in particular, you might think about the things that get you to get promoted as depending on the kind of task that you have in the corporation. Um, 
those who get promoted are those who have the high promotability tasks, those where when you perform on those tasks, people will notice how well you do. Uh, and those who don't get promoted are more likely to have a portfolio of less promotable tasks. Um, and indeed, when we sort of, um, you can think about it in, um, in industry, what is a promotable task? Well it, well, it very often tends to be the revenue generating task. Um, whereas if you want a corporation to work well, you have both revenue generating and non-revenue generating tasks. So you need somebody to do all of those tasks. The question is, where do you assign men and where do you assign the women? Uh, in academia, um, we all know that we need to teach, we need to do service for the university, and we need to do research. Um, but the thing that tends to get us promoted is whether or not we do the research. Um, and indeed, when we uh, look at the data that has looked at this, women more than men uh, tend to end up with the non-research active. They end up on more committees. Um, they end up doing more teaching, whereas men end up spending more time on the um, research side of things. Much of the research to date, including my own, has focused on, and now I'm going backwards, that's why I'm getting confused by my slides. Um, so um, you can sort of wonder, well, do people agree on what is non-promotable? We asked some faculty members um, well, what they thought was a promotable task. Uh, it turns out everybody agrees. So we asked them, if you think about an assistant professor, they have 50 more hours in a, week, in a semester, where should they spend their time? it turns out that all faculty pretty much decides that if they want to get promoted, they should work on research. And when we look at the data from academia, women more than men spend time on committee work. And if we look in industry, um, all the studies suggest that women more than men end up in less challenging tasks. They're more likely to get uh, jobs that are sort of seen as female role uh, types of tasks. Now, the, as I mentioned, there are many, many reasons why we could end up with these differences. Um, it could be that women prefer these tasks. Uh, it could be that they are more excited to uh, serve on committees, that they enjoy those types of tasks more than men. It could be that they're really, really good at them, that that's why we're assigned the women to do more of these non-promotable tasks. Or it could be discrimination. Um, what... Uh, we've been doing in behavioral economics is trying to understand if there might be other factors. Um, and in looking at the different hierarchy of tasks, what most of us have focused on is why it is that women don't end up with the high promotability tasks. My own work has shown, together with Muriel Needley at Stanford, that part of the reason is that women don't enjoy to compete as much as men. Um, part of the reason is that they're not as overconfident as men. So they don't lean in and grab the high promotability task. When a very desirable candidate or client is discussed in the corporate space, women are less likely to say, I should take the high promotability client. Um, likewise, Linda Babcock, in, in her work with her co-authors and um, in some recent work, uh, also with Muriel Needley, we have looked at women not negotiating we find clear evidence that women are less likely to take on negotiations um, for in, in lots of different environments. So um, Cheryl Sandberg sort of coined this term, women's failure to lean in, um, and recommends that women should sort of lean into the uh, promotion rank. They should work harder, fight for their rights, um, they shouldn't take so much time off. They should be leaning into the uh, labor market. Um, one of the things we've talked less about is sort of the opposite end of the hierarchy. All the research has focused on women sort of not fighting for these tasks. Um, but what about these less promotable tasks? Is that just what women get because they're not fighting for the high promotability task? Or could there be a really important behavioral phenomenon in how we allocate the tasks that none of us want to do. But we know that they have to be done within the corporation. That's what I study in this um, paper with Linda Backcock, Maria Ricalde, a former student of uh, mine, and Lori Weingard. 
Um, so how, how do we study this? Well, there are, and, and how do we think about it? So at the University of Pittsburgh, this is just an example of how we could think about a less promotable task. When we have a promotion meeting um, for an assistant professor who's coming up for tenure, what we do when we come into this meeting is that we sit around this table, the dean comes in, and he asks the honorable task of who wants to chair the committee. That sounds like a very fancy term. It really means who is going to write the report after the meeting. That is a non-promotable task. You're not going to affect any outcome, but you will spend a couple of days sitting down and writing the report. Of course, what happens, this is why these chairs very conveniently have rollers on them. Everybody pushes back from the table and says, I'm really busy, which is a surprise every time. Um, no one has yet raised their hands that I am not busy, but it's still important to make this statement because whether or not you roll back really quickly has an influence on whether or not you end up with the honorable task of chairing the committee. And what we wanted to understand is when you're in a setting like this, Who's the one who says, come on, somebody has to write the report? Because we know that the dean will not be happy with this outcome if nobody writes a report. So everyone can see we just have to do it. The question is just, who is the one who ultimately will find it so uncomfortable to be there that they will say, okay, I'll take one for a team this once? And will they do it repeatedly? That's the question that we're interested in. So one of the... Um, Less promotable task that we found in our survey of faculty was serving on faculty senate. Faculty senate is an organizing body for faculty. They have some power, but not a lot. Um, and it is not an organization that anybody ever looks at, certainly not in the U.S., if you're coming up for promotion. So you can spend hours on faculty senate, and if you come up for promotion, it is not like anyone will say, but this person served on faculty senate, we should promote her. So, um, what we um, so we what we want to study is who volunteers, who is asked to volunteer, and who accepts the request to volunteer. And the first one we're going to look at is who volunteers. So we want to look at at different tasks where people are asked to volunteer and see if there are differences. And our first example is going to be faculty senate. Uh, so does the girl sign up? Do the boys sign up? So this was done by just sending out. Um, emails to faculty members at a large uh, public university. And of course, the way that people can respond to such an email, it says, can you please serve on a committee for faculty senate? Um, and of course, you can not respond. Not surprisingly, the majority of, of people don't respond at all. Uh, you can write and say, I'm really sorry, I can't do that. Women far more than men write back and say, I'm sorry, I can't do that. But what we want to know is who is the person who volunteers. And not surprisingly, given that I'm characterizing this as a less promotable task, it's not as if people are jumping up and saying, yes, 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 please put me on faculty senate. Less than 4% of people say, sure, I'll take this one for the team. So 3.7% sign up. But are they men or are they women? 2.6% of men sign up. Now, this doesn't seem like it's completely horrible, but the only problem is in these faculty uh, environments, there tend to be many fewer women. So indeed, 7% of women say, sure, I will take on, despite the fact that I'm coming up for promotion, I will take on this job of being on faculty senate. And then you can say, well, but you have to run for this. Maybe they don't end up being elected. Well, it turns out that indeed they end up being elected. So even though we have 25% female on faculty, around 40% end up serving on faculty senate. So this is a problem, provided that women are not doing it just because they like it. Maybe the reason women are signing up for faculty senate is because they like to spend their evenings with their colleagues. <laughs> right? We don't know. So one of the benefits of having a laboratory is that we can take all these factors out. We're not stuck in a situation where people say, well, why are we messing with this? This is a voluntary system. They wouldn't be doing it unless they really like to do it. So let's take it into the laboratory where we have more control. So what we're uh, doing in the laboratory, so what I, when I talk about a laboratory, this is a laboratory in experimental economics. It sounds very scientific. It really means we just have a bunch of computers in a room 
people come in and they make incentivized decisions and we pay them based on the decisions that they make. And then we can manipulate the environment and see how they change their behavior. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to set up an, an environment that mirrored what we had uh, in the, the case that I was trying to capture. We want to figure out when I'm in this setting and everyone knows that someone should just volunteer, but they prefer that somebody else does it, who is the one who raises their hand and says, sure, I'll do it. So how do we do that? Well, we have them come into the lab, approximately 50% female, approximately 50% male, um, and 10 times in a row, they make the same decision, but they're randomly paired with people. They don't know who they're paired with. They just know that they're paired with other people in the room. And then they get paired into groups with three people, and they have two minutes to make a decision. There's a timer that counts down, and in front of them, they all have a red button. This is equivalent to raising your hand and saying, yes, I will chair the committee. And what we want to, and what they're told is, if nobody clicks the red button, you each get a dollar. But if one person clicks that button, that person get a dollar twenty-five, and the two other people get two dollars. So everyone will just be happier, the world will be better, the dean will not be upset, somebody will write the report, and you can leave the room. Okay? So that's how it's set up. So if nobody clicks, everybody gets a dollar. If you click, you get a dollar twenty-five, and the two other people get two dollars. But obviously, you prefer that somebody else would just click the button. Okay. So just to be clear, there are three people in the group. If nobody raises their hand, they each get a dollar. If you raise your hand, you get a dollar twenty-five. The two other people get two dollars. But you would much rather have one of the two other group members raise the hand and click, because then you get $2, independent of who else is clicking. Okay. So that, that's the game that they play. Um, the very exciting screen that they have in front of them, we call it Invest, is this. And now you might wonder why we have two minutes as the time limit. It's because for a college student, two minutes is pretty close to eternity. Um, <laughs> So um, sometimes I wish we, we had videotaped this experiment because it's actually, um, it is a very tense environment. You're sitting there, you have to figure out whether or not somebody's going to click. The minute somebody clicks, the round is over, you don't have to worry about it anymore. But as time goes on, it's counting down, and if you get to the end of zero, you ended up with a dollar. And you would have gotten 125 if you had just clicked. So... That, that's the environment we're looking at. Um, and as we all know, if we could just force someone to do it, we would all be better off. So do they figure it out? Do they understand that somebody should just click the button? Do they, do they get that right? Um, now, if we look at the chance that somebody is going to click, they do pretty well. About 80% of the time, someone in the group will click the button. So they're not leaving all the surplus on, on the table. Somebody will say, sure, I will write the committee report. Now, of course, our question is, does it differ by gender? Do men and women do this equally? They don't know who they're paired with. They just see the button. And, and you will not be surprised to say, when do people click? The vast majority click at the very, very end. Okay? So... Um, what we see for women is that they click about a third of the time. So over the 10 rounds, remember they do 10 different times of this, 33% um, of the time women will click. What about the men? From the very beginning, men are clicking much, much less than the women. And it's not as if they sort of start out saying, oh, let me see if I can get someone to click. And that they get towards the end of the 10 rounds and say, oh, I haven't really clicked. Maybe I should try it out. They, they stay at the same level throughout. Okay? And the difference has become quite extreme if I look at how many times out of the 10 times that you can click, do you actually click? Right? So you keep getting paired with new people. How many times do you take one for the team? So you might do it the first time around and say, okay, we should, we should figure this out. We can all be happy. Let's just click the button. How many times do you keep doing that? 
So if I look at the individual clicks, we can see that there are women who out of 10 times decide that clicking nine times, eight times, seven times, six times, there are three people in, this, in these groups. It's true that there are different people each time, but there are women, if you look at sort of um, the extremes, of course, they're quite convincing, but even going back to four, now you're doing more than your share. Okay? Whereas for the men, there are lots of men. About 50% of the men click zero or one time out of 10. Okay? Um, in fact, if we sort of say, what is the, the fair share is three or more, um, you can see that there are very large gender differences. Okay? This is completely anonymous. Nobody knows who they're matched with. And yet we see women doing this over and over. Okay? Um, now we could say, why is it that women are clicking more? Right? And there are many different reasons why you could imagine clicking more. It could be that they have different preferences. Uh, it could be that they're more worried about it not happening. They could be more altruistic. Women, we always talk about how women are so altruistic. The research on that is, is uh, not particularly uh, convincing. Not that women are not nice, but men are nice too. It's just in this environment, they're, not, they're taking more than the men are taking on. And surprisingly, we don't find any of these factors to, uh, to drive the, the difference. Another possibility is that it's driven by beliefs. It could be that I come into the room, I look around, I'm trying to figure out who's going to take one for the team. I realize that the girls are there. And I know how we play this game. Usually when the girls are there, they are the ones who click the button. The girls, on the other hand, look around. They see the guys are there. It's like, oh, I know how this works. I'm the one who has to click the button. Right? So beliefs play a fundamental role in these settings. So if I come in to, so when I go to this chairs committee, where we have to forget, or to the promotion meeting, and we have to find a chair of the committee, the dean has now gotten to the point when I'm the only female, he just says, Lisa can't do it. Okay. Because otherwise, I become the one who's different from all the other ones, and they all turn around and look at me like, okay, do you want to write another report and spend two days doing it? So beliefs are fundamental here, but the question is, how do we test that? How do we distinguish between preferences and beliefs? So in the study, we have lots of different measures for, for preferences, and none of them uh, drive our result. But another way of doing it is to say, if this is driven by women being fundamentally risk-averse, or super altruistic, if those are the preferences of women, then I should be able to take groups with all women and see them ending up in some kind of nirvana where the button is clicked, everybody's happy, they take equal turns, it's beautiful. Whereas for the men, if it is because the men are not altruistic and risk-seeking, I could potentially see them self-destruct which could be kind of cool, but that's not why I did it. <laughs> so what, what I want to do next is to say, if it's coming from preferences, then I should be able to look at all female groups and all male groups and see them behave differently. But if it's coming from beliefs, then if the guys go into the room and they look around and there are no girls there, then they will realize, oh, the girls aren't here. I'm the one who has to click the button this time. So that's what we did. So we brought in, uh, we did what we call single-sex groups. And, the, and part of the reason for doing this, as I mentioned in our initial study, when you don't know who you're paired with, of course the groups that do really, really well are the groups where we end up having all females in them. But they don't know that they're with one another. So do we see women when they know that they're with other women clicking more? Um, so now you come into the lab, the only difference relative to what we did before, is you walk in, all the other people in the room just happen to be women. Okay? And likewise for men, you walk in, all the other participants are male. Okay? So how do they do? This is when we had mixed gender sessions. We never mentioned the gender that they're with, they just happen to come in. This was our initial result, 80% of the time they invest. What happens when we get all men? Or all female, let's do all female first. All female don't do any better than the mixed gender group. It is not as if they come in and their preferences, their altruistic tendencies make them click all the time. They do exactly the same as when we have 50-50 males and females. 
What about the men? Do they self-destruct? No. Turns out that men too know how to click the button. Okay. So there are no gender differences when the guys show up by themselves. They invest at the exact same rate. So if I look at my gender gap from before, not surprisingly, in my single sex sessions, there are no gender differences. They get to the exact same point. So the, the key point is that we, we will get somebody to take on the task, but who takes on the task depends on who is there. Okay. Now, another way we could imagine doing this game, so if it's really about beliefs, which this suggests that beliefs is a fundamental part to what is driving this, if it's about beliefs and me thinking that the girls are there, they'll do it. Another way to be concerned about this is what if there was a manager? What if a manager comes into the room and he sees three workers there? He has a task that the group has to figure out how to do, but he, before they have to figure out who's going to do it, gets to point to one and says, could you please do it? And then he leaves. And now it's still up to the group to figure out how to do it. So we're, we play the exact same game as what we did before. So what if we have a manager who gets, comes in and the manager sees the workers in the room and before we play the exact same game, he just gets to point to someone and say, hey, you, can, can you, can you do it? If it's about beliefs, then we should suspect that they're more likely to point to the females. And if those beliefs are confirmed, then we would expect that women, when she's asked, is more likely to say, sure, I'll do it. So um, how do we do that um, in the laboratory? So now instead we have four people, but we have one person we call the red player. And the red player can't click the button. But... What the red player gets is if someone will click the button, anyone, the red player will also get $2. But if no one clicks the button, they get $1. So they want to ask the person who is most likely to get the group to click the button. Okay. And then once they've, once they've pointed to someone, they play the same game. Um, so in contrast to our... Um, other study where nobody knows what they're, who they're with. We don't want to say, you're paired with one female, two males, who are you going to ask? Because we don't want them to be focusing on gender. So instead, we, they come into the laboratory, we take a picture. Uh, these are graduate students at Pitt, because the undergraduates are so beautiful, we're not allowed to show them. Um, but um, this is what it looks like. So if I'm the manager, I'm showing the pictures of the people in my group, and I get to just choose one of them and say, um, so that that person will get a message where it says, the red player asked you to invest. That, that's all that happens. So, so before I start the round, I'm told the red player had asked me to do it. And the uh, two other play players see a message saying, the red player asked this person to do it. Now we play again. Now, not surprisingly the person who was asked becomes the focal player in the environment. Right? Once somebody has asked you to do it and you're trying to play this game, let's wait for 20 min two minutes and see what happens, the other people are just waiting for the person who was asked to step up to the plate. So who do they ask? Well, let's imagine that we had one female and two males. Who do, they, who do people click on? And not surprisingly, because it confirms our beliefs, and of course we always write, no, um, it turns out that the woman is asked more than the men. Okay? But now this could just be because she's the only female and there are two guys. Maybe it's just that when I look at three people and one is female, she's the one who sticks out and that's why I ask her. And, and of course she doesn't appear in the middle. They, we randomized the order so they're showing up all over the place. But if it's about the female being the focal player... I should be able to replace one of the guys and look at the groups where I have two females and one male. And if it's about the female being the focal player, I should see the guy on the right going from being asked 30% of the time to being asked 40% of the time. Right Now he becomes the focal player. So what happens if I put another female in there? If I put another female in there, what happens 
is that the request to the female stay at 40%, the guys asked even less. So this is not about the one female sticking out. It's about being female. So another sort of extreme way of, of, of looking at it is to say, um, what if we look at all the times that people are asked? Obviously, there are differences. So this is sort of like you're walking. Suppose that you need um, you know, to borrow someone's phone. You walk up to a bus stop. There's a whole bunch of people. Who's the person you ask for a favor from? Is it the male? Is it the female? If you need to borrow 10 kroners from someone, who do you ask? Right? This, this is what this is. So when you look at people, it's not like you ask everybody the same way. You try to figure out who's the one who's the friendly one. Okay. So indeed, there's lots of heterogeneity. So this is the number of times that people are asked in our, in our study. <clears throat> there's, this is per individual. So there, there's some individuals that's only asked once. There are other individuals who asked 16 times. So there's lots of heterogeneity. Men and women differ. There are some women who are asked a lot, some women who are asked a little. Same holds for men. There are, some, there are many men who are asked 10 times. But what's striking is the number of times females are asked many, many times. So it's true that there's heterogeneity, but if you look at the distribution, you see for the women they're far more likely to be asked a lot. So they get asked over and over and over, which sort of confirms this finding that indeed there is the belief that women more than men will step up to the task. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Uh, I just wonder if um, you get a different result depending on the gender of the manager, the guy who, or the girl who asks. So, so that's a, a very, very good question. Um, so is it the, do the girls ask the men? Do the, um, and is it the men who are asking the girls? It turns out, so very, very good if we're seeing what's coming up next. <laughs> it turns out that when I have a male manager and a female manager, they're both equally likely and more likely to ask the female. So, there, so there's no difference in who's asking. So both men and women um, know that it's a good idea um, to ask, um, ask a female. Okay, so 40% of the time, they end up asking um, the male and female requesters and there are, or the male and female in their group and they're less likely to end up asking the male. Okay. Um, does it turn out to be a good idea? Is it a good idea to ask the females more? Yes, it's a good idea. Because if you ask a guy, there's a 50% chance that he's going to say, sure, I'll take one for the team. If you ask a female, there's a 75% chance that she'll say yes and I'll do it for the team. Okay. Now, this 25 percentage point gap may not seem so extreme, but if you consider the fact that women during this entire experiment are asked over and over and over and over, the fact that at the end of the, if you look over all 10 rounds, they end up saying yes 75 percent of the time, tells you something about how extreme it is. So it may be the first time you're asked that you'll say, sure. Second time, sure. But you keep saying sure, and you may say no towards the end, but your response rate is still such that it, it is completely justified to keep asking you. Okay? So um, what we find in the study um, is that women are more likely to volunteer on their own. If there's just a task that's put in front of a group and you're trying to figure out who's going to take one for the team, women are more likely to say, sure, I'll do it on their own. Um, what sort of makes things even more extreme is that they're also far more likely to be asked. So if a manager comes into an office environment and he's trying to figure out who to ask, independent of the gender of that manager, the less promotable task, the one that nobody prefers to do, is more likely to end up being assigned to the female. Um, and when she's asked, she's far more likely to do it. Okay. Um, now, 
one of the things that, um, as I said, I think there's clear evidence in our study that beliefs in our environment play a, a, a strong role, um, which you can say, well, what do we do about beliefs if these are the beliefs that we hold? How do we do something about it? Um, in contrast to the work that I've done on competition, I actually find these results much more comforting in thinking about what we can do. Um, because in competition, it's like, what, what do we do? We, we see the men competing too much, being overconfident. That's not necessarily what we want our females to do, and it's not necessarily what we want our managers to do. But on this side, there are very, very easy things that we can look at to, to, to improve things, okay? So first off, we, we tend to go into these studies by coming out and saying, okay, what are we supposed to do as women? We don't want to fix the women, right? If we are a corporation, we don't want an environment where everybody's saying, no, 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 I, I can't do that. We need these tasks to be done. The fact that the women are doing them is essential to the well-functioning of our corporations, but if it truly is a less promotable task, we should be concerned about women taking it on all the time. If it is truly a task that anyone can do, and it doesn't help us out in terms of promotion, and we know that women have a tendency to perhaps earlier than men say, sure, I'll do one for the team, then we don't end up allocating this efficiently. We could end up with a more productive, more successful female taking on the less promotable task when in fact there is a less productive, less qualified male who would be a better allocation of time. Okay, so if it is truly something that we don't care who's doing it, then why are we asking for volunteers? Why don't we just randomly assign it? Why is it when I come into these meetings? Why don't we just keep count of who did it last time? Why don't we just take turns and say, how many did you do this year? So we have this weird notion that if it's voluntary, we always end up with the right person. But the problem is, if women are more likely to jump in too early, then we don't end up with the right person. So it's, they're very simple institutional changes that we can um, put in place for some of these allocations. Another important thing to think about is just being aware that this is a problem. Um, one of the wonderful examples that happens in the U.S., so as I said in... in most universities, the share of female faculty is about a quarter to 30% um, of faculty. And we came up with this wonderful rule that we're concerned about gender, and um, we want equal representation of men and women on all committees. Now, that's a wonderful rule, provided that it is essential to have equal representation on all committees and provided that you don't make the women carry the burden of this additional committee assignment. So if, if it is truly essential that you have equal representation, then you need to come up with a compensation system that justifies that. It can't be that you put an extra burden on these women so that they can't advance uh, in the workplace. Um, and as I said, you know, most people you talk to, they're like, no, we don't have a gender problem because we have equal representation. It's like, well, how are you going to do that if you only have 25% female on your faculty? Um, so certainly being aware of this and documenting who ends up doing it, uh, it comes down to something as wonderful as organizing the holiday party. Um, it doesn't have to be the females every time. Um, so what about the... So as much as I don't want to fix the women, the question sort of always comes up, well, what, what am I supposed to do? How do I, how do I get these changes in place? Um, so I do think that there are some things that you can do um, as an individual as well. Um, more so than just um, saying no when you're asked, is figuring out how to say yes to the right thing. So... Um, when someone comes to you and asks you to take on one of these less promotable tasks, to be ready for the negotiation. So you say, that's a lovely committee. I would love to be on committees for committees, but I was thinking being more on the executive committee was the place you, you should be using me. So being prepared so that every request to take on a less promotable task is one, something where you're ready um, 
to negotiate for a, a better committee assignment. Um, another thing that, so th this whole project, uh, which is done by Academic Scarlet, is actually started by um, three of us being in what we call a no club. Uh, and as much as I talk about saying yes to the right task, this actually is called a no club, which... Um, but what we would do, because we were all overtaxed, was that we would meet and talk about the major requests that we were getting and how we could better uh, say no to certain tasks and, and figuring out what are the triggers that make me take on too much all the time. Um, and for me, certainly, the, the biggest issue was understanding what is my implicit no every time I say yes to something new. So... Um, what, what is it that you're going to say no to? When they're suddenly, if you're suddenly asked to be editor of a journal or take on a major task, what, what is the thing that you're going to say no to instead? And in my case, my implicit no was without um, exemption, my children. Because that was the only place I had any slack. Um, and once I became aware that taking on another job meant that it would be another Saturday or Sunday I wasn't with my kids, or that when another student came in and asked me to do something because they absolutely needed it, and I felt like, yes, I must do that for them now. Once I became aware of the image of my children next to the person asking for the request, it became much easier to say, no, I'm, I'm really sorry, I can't do that. And so being aware of what the traders are um, that are in place is essential. Another thing that I've, in talking to industries, that they've actually, so they're very well aware that when women come up for promotion, that they tend to have more non-revenue generating tasks in their portfolio. And what they've noticed is that at these meetings, when a not very attractive client is being assigned, that women voluntarily end up taking the less attractive client. And what they've started talking to them about is like, when we come in and the less attractive client is presented in front of you and you get to that uncomfortable stage where nobody's taking one for the team, rather than raising your hand and saying, sure, sure, I can fit it in. Look around at what everyone else is doing. Notice how they're all checking their phones, packing up their papers, putting it in their bag, suddenly being busy with something else. Just find ease in mirroring those behaviors. Start looking at your phone. Start packing up your bag. Don't get that discomfort that comes when everyone is just waiting for someone to, to pull the trigger. Because we know, certainly in this environment, someone will take on the task because someone has to do it. But it doesn't always have to be the female who's taking it on. Okay, so on that note, thank you very much. Thank you. You can stay here in case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, so we have time for like one or two questions before we let Anna in. Uh, so when you are, so a question over there. So use the microphone and present yourself with your name and the organization you come from. So. Katarina Döverdje from Länsstyrelsen in Stockholm. Uh, I was uh, thinking about, do you know anything about what the results would be if you put on an intersectional perspective? For example, like skin color, or would the outcome be different? Uh, so that that's a very good question. We don't know anything about that yet. Um, the 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 graph I showed with the number of people who are asked um, is the subsection of the data, which is the about ninety percent of our data, which is Caucasian. Uh, the one thing we can see in our data is that if you are non-Caucasian, which in, in our sample is predominantly Asian people are less likely to ask you. And it, I think more than anything, it is a question of beliefs. It, it is a question of, I don't know if you are an Asian female or an Asian male. Are, is it the same gender role that is, that is going to show up? So we don't know that yet. So this, this paper was just um, published, but, but it's a very, very interesting question. Um, and, and once you move into to looking at... Um, different races, it, 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 um, beliefs could be, could be different. Um, you know, it would be very interesting to look at this in, in African-American populations as well and see if, um, 
if the beliefs are held differently. Um, if we are actually, so, so the, the one thing we are doing, which is a little crazy, I never thought I would do this, we're actually just now rolling it out in Malawi. Um, one of the intriguing things in Malawi is that you have lots of little villages. Some of them are matrilineal and some of them are patriarchal. So to further understand the beliefs that's underlying that, we want to see if you're in a matrilineal society. Uh, one of the catchphrases that the anthropologists have for Malawi in the matrilineal societies is that uh, they'll say things like, you know, we're um, tired of being the breeding bulls and watching the children all the time. So it gives you a sense of how that society is, is, is quite different. Okay, I think we'll wait for, we have more time for questions afterward in the discussion, so we'll let Anna in to give some comments. Oh, yes. Okay, hey. Um, so uh, my name is Anna Sandberg, and I'm a researcher at the IIES. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So first, I just want to thank Lise for an amazing and super interesting presentation. I think we can all agree about that. Um, so during the next 10 minutes, I will talk a little bit about an issue that I have done some research on and that I think is quite closely related to what Lise was talking about, namely gender differences in negotiation behavior and outcomes of wage negotiations. Um, so I will focus primarily on two Swedish studies on this topic and then end with a couple of open questions for Lisa. Okay. Oi. So, <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, okay, so during the past decade, um, researchers in many fields have increasingly turned to studying gender differences in negotiation behavior. And why is this? So first and foremost, as you probably can guess, um, you know, we're interested in the possibility that gender differences in negotiation behavior may account for part of the persistent gender gaps we see in promotions and in wages. And here it's particularly important to remember that even seemingly very small differences in starting salaries can accumulate over time and amount to quite substantial differences in lifetime earnings and pensions. Also, recently, we have seen increasingly decentralized wage setting systems in many labor markets, which means that, of course, individual negotiations are becoming more and more important. Globally, we see that rates of unionism are declining. And in Sweden, we see that the scope for individual wage setting within collective bargaining agreements has been um, increasing a lot during previous years. Okay. So previous studies from the US, um, including Lisa's recent work, which is super interesting on this topic, um, you know, indicates that on average, men seem to be more willing to enter negotiations than women. So to study this in a Swedish context, together with Karin Hederos at the Institute for Social Research, I conducted an experiment. Um, so this was almost 10 years ago now, and um, we enlisted uh, around 200 students in Stockholm to participate in this study. So we asked participants to find as many words as they could in a word puzzle and they had three minutes. So here you can see, uh, for instance, this is the word puzzle and in the top left corner you see the Swedish word for cheese. And uh, um, before um, they, um, they started with this word puzzle, all participants were informed that they would earn between 30 and 100 kroner to participate in the study. So when the participant had finished the word puzzle, found as many words as he or she could find, uh, an experimenter approached the participant. The experimenter handed out 30 kroner, the minimum payment, and said, thank you for participating. You will receive 30 kroner. Is that okay? 
And of course, what we're interested in here is to see whether the participant says, oh, yes, thank you, that's great, and takes the 30 kroner. Or if the participant tries to initiate a negotiation to get a higher payment. Okay. So, so what do we see here? So in line with previous findings from the US, we see that also among Swedish students, at least in this context, men are more likely to ask for a higher payment. 42% of male participants, but only 28% of female participants say that they want more money. Now, our experiment wasn't you know, explicitly designed to nail down the mechanisms behind this result. But what we can say is that this gender gap is not driven by the fact that men are better at the task. In fact, on average, women find slightly more words in the word puzzle. We do see that men are more overconfident than women, and this is also in line with uh, several papers that Lisa has published um, using US data. Um, so after the experiment, we ask all participants to guess how well they did um, in the word puzzle relative to the average participant. And what we see here is that even though men didn't perform better than women, they think they did. And this gender gap in confidence can account for roughly one third of the gender gap we see here in, um, in the propensity to initiate negotiation. So I also wanted to mention a more recent study, which is super interesting, by Jenny Seveso de Bari at the Institute for Social Research. So she uses like, completely unique data from a very large survey of recent college graduates in Sweden. And in this survey, um, these college graduates are asked whether they stated a salary request when they were hired for their first job after graduation, and if so, how much they requested and how much they received. And interestingly, in contrast to our experiment, she actually finds that women are, in this context, not less prone than men to state the salary request. However, when they do state the salary request, they request less and they receive less. So, you know, to sum up previous literature on this topic, it seems as if, at least in some settings, part of the time, women seem to be um, less likely than men to um, initiate negotiations and, and receive a, a lower payoff from the negotiation. So w why, why do we see this? Why is this the case? So I think um, a theory that has been put forward uh, primarily by social psychologists, um, the theory of backlash, is quite interesting in this setting. So according to this theory of anticipated backlash, you know, in a very, very simplified <laughs> way, uh, we could think about it in this way. So what if women and men who behave exactly the same, for instance, who say, well, I think I want a higher salary in a wage negotiation? <laughs> what if they are not actually treated the same in the negotiation situation? What if, for instance, you know, the manager thinks that the man who asks for more is an ambitious go-getter, while the woman is you know, a bit strange and aggressive? In fact, previous studies, again primarily by social psychologists, indicate that something like this may actually be going on, at least in some cases. In some contexts and situations, it, it seems to be more socially costly for women to act in an assertive and self-interested way. Um, and the reason for this is that you know, this type of behavior violates uh, traditional and, and prescriptive stereotypes about how women should act. You know, traditionally, we associate masculinity with being agentic and a breadwinner, and femininity with being like the selfless, passive caretaker. And some argue that this leaves women in a sort of competent versus likable dilemma. You know, if you negotiate... You're seen as competent, but not likable. You might even get the wage raise, but your college will like you less. If you don't negotiate, um, 
you're seen as likable. Everyone thinks that you're nice enough, but you won't get the same pay raise as your male peers. Um, so I just wanted to end this brief presentation uh, by leaving some open questions for Lisa. Uh, so I think it would be super interesting to hear like how Lisa thinks about these issues and how it relates to her work on non-promotable tasks. So do you think that women risk being punished more than men for saying no when asked to do a non-promotable task? And even if that's not the case, do you think that in some settings women fear to be punished more than men for saying no? And how should we think about the link between gender gaps in negotiation behavior and gender gaps in accepting non-promotable tasks? Do you think these two uh, phenomena can be related and even have some similar driving forces? Thank you. Yeah. So, can we have both of you over there? Yeah. So thank you so much, Anna. Um, so yeah, why not? Don't let Lisa start. If you have anything to say about this, there is there a risk, similar risk of a backlash uh, if women start start saying no more, for example. No, I think there definitely is. Um, we did actually look at uh, backlash um, in our particular setting. Um, it's not the ideal setting to look at because someone says yes most of the time, so it's hard to actually um, observe the backlash. The one intriguing thing we saw in the backlash in our study, so in this setting, the, the manager gets to see whether or not the person said yes, and he can decrease the payoff of the person if um, he or she wants to, to decrease it. Um, what we see there is while there is no gender difference uh, in terms of punishment, uh, men uh, punish far more than women. So, um, you know, it, it, we, we, we don't in our setting see uh, differences in backlash, but I think it, it, it is a question of the particular environment that we're in. Um, so there could certainly be um, backlash for saying no. Uh, and that's part of the reason why the recommendation is not to go out and say no. Uh, the recommendation is not to, um, you know, show up at work tomorrow and and say no to everything that you're supposed to, that that every because you know doing these tasks is is part of the job. It's not optional. But finding a way to getting the distribution to be slightly more equal uh, might be an easier conversation to have, and that's that's precisely why I I, I recommend opening it up as a as a negotiation. Um, the the one thing that's um you know for a lot of these factors we we do have to be cautious about the recommendations that we make um so i i uh very much appreciate uh the the suggestion that some these factors are are all related uh one of the things that we we just completed a, a study on on negotiation where we do find that women are negotiating less um but they're negotiating exactly the right amount. So in, oftentimes when we talk about negotiations, we talk about it as if there are no downsides to negotiation. But there are lots of downsides to negotiations. And it's not just the fact that there could be backlash. It is also that if you go into a negotiation and don't come out successful, if you go into your boss and say, I, I want another 10,000 Swedish crowns, and he says no, Walking out of that negotiation is going to change your chances of winning a negotiation in the future. If there were no downsides to negotiating, we would all be asking all the time. We would be in our, you know, boss's offices every single day saying, oh, you know, I'm thinking, <laughs> could I go home at three today? <laughs> but there are lots of downsides. We can't ask all the time, right? So it's not just backlash. It's also in terms of your chance of succeeding in the future, what kind of jobs are you getting further down the line? Um, so um, what was intriguing in our study, and that's where, you know, coming back to all of these forces being related, is that what we saw in the negotiation, if anything, men are asking too much. It's not that women weren't asking. In our study, women asked exactly the right amount. Uh, if we forced them to ask more, they would end up with more losses. And the thing that looks like it's driving it for the men is that they're far more overconfident about how well they will do. So this, this overconfidence for males, which we've shown 
uh, systematically. And just to give us a sense of how extreme it can be, we, we have another study on, on competition where they're performing math tasks and there are no gender differences. And we asked them in groups of four, how good do you think you were at the math task? And uh, obviously, since there are no differences, 25% of the men should say, I think I'm best in the group of four. 75% of the men uh, think that they're best in their group of four. <laughs> okay, so including the, the worst performing men comes out of there. In, in five minutes, he managed to add up five two-digit numbers. Okay. No, it's not even five, sorry. They have five two-digit numbers, this particular individual, and there are several of them who are close by, managed to add up four sets of five two-digit numbers. And you ask him, how good are you? I'm best. <laughs> so th that tells you, also, th it tells you a little bit about where our recommendation should not be. The recommendation is not to be overconfident. We don't want overconfidence uh, people, but I think the overconfidence... Um, can drive the negotiation. Um, I think it's, it certainly drives um, the, the gender gap in competition. Um, it, it's less clear to me how overconfidence uh, necessarily fit in to our um, accepting less promotable task um, because it's sort of the, it's the reverse of the competition, but, but um, we will have to find out. So do you want to comment on that, Anna, or shall I see if there No, no, questions? I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, okay. <laughs> we have to do more research. <laughs> can agree. I think many of us agree. I mean, you, you hear laughter when you discuss the experimental results, and I think that's because people recognize what, what mm. you're, you're telling you yeah. from, from own experiences. So talking about own experience, were there more questions from the audience? Because now we have some mm. time, so we can take you and then Mia, perhaps. So wait for the mic, and please present yourself with your name and organization. <laughs> Åsa Wallin från Nyhetsbrevet Fond och Bank. So I have a question. Uh, you say that women are more likely to do the least likable uh, uh, things. So what is your suggestion to, do, to get men to do also these tasks? Um, so this, you know, but part, of the, part of the suggestion is in talking at a department level in how these tasks are being um, allocated. It, it's not something that a single woman can change. It has to be something that's coming from the administration. So turn-taking, a random assignment, um, keeping count um, of, the, of the number of uh, less promotable tasks are being allocated to the female. Um, but, but I think it is a discussion that we all need to have. Um, I mean, sort of at the at the extreme level, it's, we, we know that if the girls are not there, the guys will st step up. You know, if, the, the, if the guys go fishing in a cabin somewhere, magically the dishes get done. Um, <laughs> you know, so if, if the girls are not stepping up, but it is not, um, the recommendation is not for women to just start saying no. It is to try to navigate the system and bringing awareness to the issue that's going to get us somewhere. But in contrast to these other cases where it's much harder to figure out how to solve it. How do we solve the fact that women negotiate less, uh, that they compete less? It's, it's hard to figure that one out. The allocation of less promotable tasks is something that is very easy to do from an institutional perspective. And, and simple awareness, I really think, will help um, allocate it better. Hi, Anna Kadrich from Nordea. Uh, I'm wondering if you're optimistic about any any law uh, to be put in place in view of the fact that just a few days ago we have been observing Uber board of director commenting about uh, uh, increased num uh, number of hours spent talking if women are on the board of directors, as well as a U.S. senator being admonished for uh, asking questions uh, during a committee hearing. So... Uh, do you have any hopes for a legal aspect and uh, trying to fix that gap? Um, I, 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 I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, I, th I think that's why... Um, I, I think the avenue that's going to help improve some of these things... That, I mean, certainly you, you, can't, you can't legalize speech. Um, right? So, I mean, lately uh, it, it might just be a general tendency... Um, a very unfortunate tendency in the U.S. where we suddenly 
have found it permissible to say things uh, that we all agreed shouldn't be said, uh, not just about women, but about uh, all kinds of humans. Um, and uh, I think this is just part of that uh, general phenomena that suddenly you can say anything you think, even if you've been taught your entire life that that is not, you may have that thought, but we agreed that that was not an okay thought. We decided on that legally. Um, but freedom of speech uh, makes it very hard to, um, to legalize on those issues. And th that's why I think the, the avenue that's going to lead to change is talking to industry on what matters most to them, which is the amount of money that you make. And what we see on the competition and what we see on these less promotable tasks is that if you don't find a way to get the most talented worker to do the right job, you're losing money. Um, and if, you know, th there are, what's somewhat intriguing in the, in the U.S. is that many industries now have diversity officers that are trying to figure out how do we get the most talented women to keep moving up. And, and what they find at some point is that the women don't want to move up anymore. But maybe part of it is that the jobs that they're doing are too demanding, that there are too many of these less promotable tasks, that there's too, doing the same job is, is, requires more. Um, what we want are the best qualified workers doing the right job. And if we saddle women with more of these less promotable tasks, we will never be able to figure out what qualities they have because they're going to be busy doing holiday parties and filling the dishwasher. And I mean, these are the extremes. There, there are many other less promotable tasks that, that look like they're okay. Um, so at least giving people an equal chance coming out and being aware that allocating what seems like an innocent task predominantly to women is not going to give them a chance to ever show the, the talent that they have. But what's in, in our study on, on gender differences in competition, the most talented women, the, the, the best performing women, the best performing people in the group, if you are female, you choose not to compete. You, you choose to just say, no, I'll just take my peace rate and not even go into the competition at all. And part of that is because they're less confident about how good they are. Um, they, but it's not that they're underconfident. It's just that they're not overconfident that, like the men. But even conditional unconfidence, women are less likely to go into that competition. And from the industry's perspective, that is a problem because you want to find those women. Instead of saying, you know, we have this particular job, people should apply. Maybe you need to look in your organization and say, the best person is not necessarily going to apply on their own. If I want a particular female to take on this job, I need to go to her and say, this job is something that you need to be um, you know, applying for. So it, talking to the, the, the pocketbook is, I, I think the, the, many of these changes will be coming through that, um, I hope. I think we have two more questions from the audience and then we'll probably have to wrap up. So was you? Yeah. Yeah, it was me. I'm uh, Corin Siodmar Helgeson from the Stockholm School of Economics. And I know uh, I had some master's students who looked into um, leadership programs for women. And one reason they did that was that they feel worried because there are all these programs around. And as women, they kind of feel, well, they should be interested in taking these programs. On the other hand, they're also focused on, you know, sometimes there's something that's not wrong with women, but, you know, what women do and their preference and so on. So I think what your research indicates is not about women per se, but rather how they are being treated in their organisations. So I know you want to be careful about recommendations, but looking at those kinds of programmes, like leadership programmes for women and mentoring and so on, what would be your advice to people working on these programmes and what would be your advice to young students coming out, you know, when they graduate, should they go work in such organisations that have those programmes or would it rather be better to work somewhere else? because you have this focus on preference rather than what you say beliefs, or as I would say, have a different background as, as you know, the norms or stereotypes. Um, I, th I think it's all part of the solution. One, one of the um, benefits of being in um, something like a leadership program is also that you get peers who are in that leadership program. Um, another problem that we're finding fairly systematically, is that the networks that women have um, are limited uh, relative to those 
held by men, especially as you move up and you, there are fewer, fewer women around. Um, what we've done su successfully in economics is that we um, have uh, not just mentoring programs for, for women, um, but programs that often end up looking more like sponsorships, um, where you have she senior females who are uh, advocating for you. So that if, if someone is trying to hire someone, if I have the right names to recommend, I'm not just going to look at the guys that everybody else is talking about. I might have the female to put in the, in the basket. So I don't know if leadership programs necessarily are just focused on preferences. I think there are many uh, benefits to a leadership program uh, along with that. Um, you know, there, there are many ways that it would be nice to change uh, the way that we do things. The, the whole hierarchy and the, the manner in which we promote uh, people is a, is a very male model. It has worked really, really well for men. You, you work really hard. You do well. The individual applies for a promotion. They get promoted. They move up. It works very well for the man. Um, in the ideal wor world, we might want to reconsider that. Why is it necessarily just one man who gets promoted? Could it be a team? Would that, would that be better? But those are changes that are so hard to imagine. That I, I think what, I, what I'm encouraged by on the less promotable task is that I think there are quite simple things that we can do. Um, there are many things I wish we could do, but certainly on the less promotable task, just being cognizant of how we allocate them uh, will help. And, and certainly understanding that when I'm looking for a volunteer, if women, so the, within economics, the notion is if you ask for a volunteer, people are going to sit around and they're going to look at their opportunity cost of time. And the person who has the lowest opportunity cost of time will suddenly raise their hand and say, I'll do it, which is a beautiful model because the right person already raises, always is the one who ends up with the, with the task. But if women, just from the discomfort of sitting there, always raises her hand too quickly, then I don't end up with the right person in the task. And, and understanding that, um, I, I think, will help us get a more equal distribution. Okay, so we take one last super quick question and then... Uh, super quick. Uh, Mia Hunavransen, I'm the CEO here at SNS. When you described your implicit no thinking, you had the picture of your children. I was wondering, in a man's head, what would be the picture? <laughs> would that be the uh, promoting task, maybe? Or would it be children? How, and what does that mean, if there is a difference for, for, for the discussion we've had here today? No, so that that's a that's an absolute that, that's an excellent question, um, and I, I I very much appreciate it. Um, I think for all of us, thinking about the implicit no uh, is essential, um, and even if for women, um, the implicit no is the promotable task. It should cause you pause. It, it should. So so that's. I'm not saying if if the image is your children, you should say no. Um, <laughs> But, but being aware of what is it that you're giving up. And, that, and this is not to say that you should look at your implicit no and decide, oh, I have better things to do, because this is a less promotable task. We will all have better things to do. We will all have things where we can shine more. That's why none of us want to do it. So anybody who's presented with a less promotable task will see the implicit no as being some, but something that is preferred. Um, but if you see that picture too much, whether it's a more promotable task, your children, it, it should be cause for, for pause before you say, sure, you need a recommendation by Monday and this is Friday afternoon. I'll, I'll do that over the weekend to say, you know, if you couldn't ask me until Friday afternoon, I, I guess you're in trouble. To, so it, it's, it's more that, that issue. In, instead of all, always being ready to help and say yes, to, um, and I'm sure from many, many men, um, and there are many wonderful men who are spending tons of time. I'm married to one. He's spending, he's with my children now. I would not be able to do what I do if it was not because of what he does. Um, from many of them, their image will be their children as well. But at some point, 
we all need to get balance in what it is that we're saying yes and no to. And from the industry's perspective, it is a problem if we saddle the women with too large a share of these um, tasks. So thank you so much. I think we have ten there. Mikkel wanted to say some final words, and then then you're all off. Oh, okay. Yes, this marks the end of the today's seminar. And on, on the behalf of SNS, I would like to thank uh, Lise, Anna and Robert for joining us today. I would also like to th thank you in the audience for joining us and also uh, inform you uh, of the next seminar within the IIES SNS uh, International Policy Talks. On September the 14th, uh, we will have uh, the award-winning economist Matthew Genskob, uh, which is professor at Stanford University. He will be visiting us and talk about social media, fake news, and how uh, that affects uh, political uh, polarization. So you can sign up for this uh, seminar at our website. And welcome next time. Mm-hmm.